close to an amazing transformation. Amazing. Hello. Are we, are we being heard? Oh my goodness. She actually may have probably been, she's learned like uh, Tony Wolf. He took a lot. Took a lot. And of course. Are you hearing me? Are you there? No. Uh, she, she was doing quite a lot of innovative work. And some of you, if you listen, if you read the book, you'll find out that some of his key ideas came Hello, from can you hear me? I see there's one person online. Can you send us a text message saying you can hear us? Can you hear me? Okay. Anyway, her life was cut short with the Nazis. <laughs> okay, somebody's responding there. Um, all right, um, but I don't. All right, let me try this again because I'm not sure that I have connected to the Wi Fi here. Let's just see. what I'm doing wrong but are you able to hear are you able to hear are you folks able to hear that's the question um, this doesn't seem to be registering hmm. Waiting for it. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, I'm hopeful that you're hearing me. I don't know why this is not working. It's not good. Okay, so you can hear me, Vince. Thank you. Um, I don't know why this is not working. Okay. We were out doing something and we get on the Okay, we're going to start here momentarily. All right. Um, I have had to disconnect my um, mic because it doesn't seem to be working. I'm going to try one more time and then we'll go ahead just with the telephone mic. Um, okay, let me see. Ah, uh, there. Now you can hear me. <laughs> okay, I think that's working now. I don't know why it was not before. Okay, we're in session number 128 of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group. If you can believe that, we've done this for three years. And today is the first day of year four, the first day of the fourth year of this group. Believe it or not, we're still at it. And so... So, hello, <laughs> John and Debbie and Bill are here, they're in a private conversation at the moment, but we're going to gather their information soon. So, 
What have you done Jungian in the last month? <laughs> I've been have been picking apart aspects of the feminine, particularly um, the women, in, and I just find find it so prescient and fascinating that he was predicting everything that was hap that would happen with the feminist movement and the dilemmas that women face as a result of the feminist movement. Right, and that's in, in volume ten of Collected Works. And it was written in 1927. Right, and so, but it's very compact and with ideas and I just love to just tease apart the ideas so I've been working on that for a couple of months just that one essay you know, yeah. that one lecture there's so. a lot of good stuff there yeah uh, a lot of good stuff um, okay, I'm gonna try to get my um, chat going here on my other iPhone and, uh, so what did you learn <laughs> um that it raises more questions than I had when I started. <laughs> uh, Especially uh, now. Have you watched the... But the, the, key thing, the key thing that I learned is that he was saying that women who experience uh, their masculine and develop their masculine are in love with a thing rather than in love with a man, which is their natural nature, their... their, their not their, uh, it's their inferior nature to love a thing, which would be like a business or a concept or right. it's a masculine, that's a masculine energy. And, and so they're operating outside of their, uh, the majority of their psyche, which right. is a feminine aspect. And, and, and so, so that they. That's happening in Switzerland and Germany before 1927. Apparently so, uh -huh. as a result of the war. World War, I. World War One, and so, but he said that once she learns to embrace her masculine side, then she can't go back. And he says the same is true with a man who embraces his his feminine side. So he's talking about there's this there's this um, tension of good and you know the good products and the bad products in that whole process, and that's what I found fascinating because. It's, you know, we see that in our culture. We see women who are becoming executives, they're running companies, they're becoming wealthy, but they're they're giving up a lot for for that. Right. And so it's a it's it's an interesting. Um, it just all comes. You know, just it was all written down in this in this 1927. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, a few interesting things that I've noted about Germany. Okay, first of all, I think four million Germans were killed in World War I, men, almost all men. And so they, um, you know, the women had to be busy producing the next generation because they literally... You know, World War II came along as soon as they had produced the next generation. And I suspect that a lot of those children were actually born out of wedlock. I suspect, because there weren't enough men to go around. And, of course, that happened again after World War II. Yeah, that is described in uh, the same... I think that's described in... Women in Europe also, and he particularly treats that subject in here that that um, women will go outside of the law uh, to uh, to achieve love, but that they're held back by their their unconscious, um, I guess, their culture, their culture, yeah, and I think that's. I think that's covered in marriage as a psychological relationship, or it may be in women in Europe. I can't remember which one. But, but uh, he, what's what's really beautiful about it is he's he's reaching all these conclusions about what's happening in history based on his knowledge of the psyche and the, the depths of the psyche. And, and um, so that's what's so fascinating. It's what I'm like. Teasing all, I'm teasing all that apart because it's universal knowledge. I mean, it's very valuable knowledge. Yeah. Well, one of the 
so I did get up the chat. And so hi, Art. Hi, he's a Grace. Good to see you. And, uh, Sherry. So, okay, well, we're, we're done eating, but we're not done drinking. So, <laughs> so I have my giraffe and uh, the Mary Yim group. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Mary Yim. So, Bill, what have you been doing? Jungian. Jungian arts. Well, yeah, I had to think about it because I've been doing a lot of stuff. One thing I did was read the um, the book on Hesse and uh, Jung by Serrano, the Chilean. Right. And uh, that was pretty interesting. He he was running back and forth. He was a young guy when he met Jung and Hesse. Uh -huh. And he started talking with them, and he would go back and forth between the two guys just as in their you know their twilight years there right, right. and uh, he befriended them and he came to know them pretty well and so uh, my big interest was it, I read the Hesse part first because that's why I was reading it I, I wanted to I've read all of Hesse's stuff for the most part so I wanted I wanted something to rekindle my memories about the Hesse stuff because that was something else I was doing and then I went back and read the first front of the book, which was Jung. And th they knew each other, has and Jung. What, what, what is the name of the book? Uh, I don't know. The author is Hesse? No, no Serrano. S-C-R-R-A-N-O. S-C-R-R. S-E, right? Yes, S-E-R-R-A-N-O. Sounds like an Italian. He's Chilean. Oh, Chilean. Chilean. And it's, what's the topic of the book? Uh, Hesse and Jung. He he was a pretty young guy. He met them. Uh, he wanted. He was really. I don't. Since I read it backwards, <laughs> I often just start a book where it gets my attention. You know, page one usually bores me because it's all introductory. And then the introductory stuff's interesting after you've read everything else. But <laughs> so I uh, anyway I. I I started out with Hesse and, and came around to Jung, and he, he, I can't, you know, it was all over the place. There was, there was no theme so much, as the theme being that I knew these guys, as this is what we talked about, and they knew each other, and I would, you know, interact uh, via the two. They would, I would say, well, Hesse said this, Jung, Jung said that, and back and forth. The other thing I did was Neumann. I read yeah. Neumann, who's... Uh, Which book? Uh, gosh, that's a tough one. I, I may have scanned through a lot of his stuff. Um, the most recent... Actually, the most the one I was reading this morning was The uh, Great Mother. I was just reading the part on archetypes. Um, just so... Uh, you know... I, I, I like the way he states things, but you know the the way he talks about it, and he's very direct. And so I just wanted to see what he was saying about that. And the reason I went there was because I was looking for stuff about Anima. Yeah, I, I think we all need to read about the Great Mother. By it's called the Great Mother by Eric Neumann, who was uh, first generation key uh, disciple of Jung's. And he wrote a terrific book. He wrote it during World War II called The Great Mother. He also wrote um, The Origins and History of Consciousness, right? Okay. So, yeah, um, so Fear of the Feminine. Fear wrote, of the Feminine. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> he also wrote The Amor, Psyche and Amor, mm -hmm. which is the one I think is the easiest one to get into him if you want to start reading that guy and to me that of course I like the mythology stuff and that one that one's a real good one for knocking your socks out yeah it's better if you already have an idea what you think it's about and then to read him you know mm -hmm. rather than just to go in and sort of with a you know a soup spoon and ladle, ladle it up yeah so, um, I have a couple of comments here. Um, one from Art, which, Art, I need a little bit more information. What is APAY? A -P -A -Y? 
how does this affect transgender people? Uh, I mean, uh, Art, I'd very much appreciate it if you'd tell me what this is. Um, because you say, how does this ape, and then how does this, does anybody know what ape is, A-P-A-Y? Well, it could just be spell correct, who knows? <laughs> yeah, um, and then it says, okay. how does this affect transgender people? I have no, no clue right now, Art, because I'm not understanding your question. Now, Sherry, um, I really enjoyed the Wembley concert. Uh, however, I really wish that I had been physically there, you there are. because unfortunately, well, dang. Uh, it's very hard to get the energy of the place into, uh, uh, into your computer. But I very much appreciated and enjoyed uh, yeah, it was the concert just asking for and a while ago. it really made the most recent concert I'd, I'd seen before that seem rinky-dink by comparison. I think I mentioned it, I may have mentioned it, that uh, uh, I went and saw Bob Dylan and Willie Nelson one time and that was at a local minor league baseball team's stadium and Dylan didn't play any of his old songs so I really couldn't hear what he was singing and he had these he had big speakers but when he left Willie Nelson was left there with a with a club date uh, electric guitar <laughs> with, with little little tiny speakers that might work in a small club, but they certainly didn't work in that stadium. We couldn't hear them at all. It was like, here's Willie Nelson up here in the center field <laughs> playing away, but nobody could hear it. But anyway, that was not BTS. They were pyrotechnics and and uh, big screens and very, and very impressive presentation. I really liked it. Um, okay, so we're up and running, and it's possible that we may get cut off on this phone because it may right now have power. If it does, then I can start again on this one, possibly. We'll see. But uh, meanwhile, while we've been delaying here, uh, Brendan has arrived, and so Brendan, did you see the emails about the enneagram? I did. Okay, and I, I've got my enneagram here. And Bill has his too. Bill has his graph. too. And he's got his graph too. Should I sit there? Yeah. 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 Put you in the middle. Um, so Brendan is going to score Skip. Skip is uh, going to be fully. Uh, huh? Assessed. Okay, Skip is going to be assessed here. Good. Well, let's hope. Let's hope not. <laughs> so, all my fans in the uh, in. But it will understand online. why we don't get along. Right. <laughs> all, all my friends online will now get a, a full assessment of what Skip is like from Brendan. And so that should be good. Well, I was, interesting anyway. If not I was good. thinking you should give up while you're ahead. Ah, okay. <laughs> Skip, that's probably the, um, the best thing to say. Um, you are a type five. Take five, okay. Mm -hmm. How do you do? Where did you? He did? And, um, Skip, you sent me your score, and if I may read it out to the um, assembled people. Once you answered all the questions and totaled the score on all the pages, you came down to the highest score on your um, rank out of all the pages, you had 24 check marks in the column H. Mm -hmm. That was higher than all the other columns in the uh, 12 pages. Only by two, though. Two, only only two by others. two, correct. So it, it's kind of possible that you could be an eight or a seven. There were some that I wanted to answer both ways. And what that shows me is that you, you scored very highly in one 
triad, one section of the um, Enneagram, um, which means you have very positive identification traits. Very, very. Now, the one that was next to you on the Enneagram, which is your wing, your subtype, mm -hmm. is four. So I am, I am suggesting that you are a, a, a type five with a wing four. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're in very distinguished company. Um, and there was another one there too, though. There was 22. Oh, yeah. Type 8 and Type 7. But they are not next to each other. Oh, okay. the, the, those wings are not next to each other. Okay. So tell us what Type 5 means, because well, most I, of us don't know what any of I thought means at all. So. It would be amusing. I don't know. Is there anybody around this table besides me who knows you as little as I do? No. I just Googled Type 5. Yeah. It says alert, insightful, curious. And before you go ahead, what I was thinking, just in, in, very, in very quick terms, uh, Bill, can you just come up with three words to describe Skip? And maybe you can, because you know him better than I do, and maybe you can. And then we'll he's only met me twice, but, but yeah. <laughs> and then we'll just say what see what the enneagram oh, okay. has revealed, what he's okay. revealed about himself through the enneagram tool. Okay. So, Bill, why don't you say three first words. of all three words to describe this man? <laughs> Does he have to go into a booth where he can't hear me? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be on video anyway. <laughs> uh, I don't know. This Personable, articulate. Personable, articulate. And um, uh, exuberant. Exuberant. And Skip, I um, since I uh, first met you, I found you welcoming, um, enthusiastic, um, and very cerebral, analytical. What, what was the first analytical? Maybe yeah, that's four words. Mm -hmm. Cerebral. You're you're up in your head. Cerebral. I'm definitely He's up. Thank you. Okay. What would you say about Skip? I would say uh, personable, also gregarious and scholarly. Gregarious, mm -hmm. gregarious. Mm -hmm. You're very yeah, have been able to make you are uh, like contact far more than I am. I have a PhD. <laughs> You're more of a scholar than I am. Really? Well, I I jump all over the place. I don't find anybody that I just go after. Well, it's it not is. like I don't have an education, though, Bill. Well, I know, <laughs> but it, I mean, it's it's like. A, a, you know, I've been a professor and everything else, but I was never a scholarly type. You're very intellectual. You like intellectual pursuits. Yeah, it seems to me. Definitely. Do you have anything you want, or are you well, now say, too influenced by that? No. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, well, along the wise, everyone said this cerebral, intelligent, and visionary. Visionary. Okay, well, that's, okay. that's encouraging. <laughs> so... Gracias. So to describe your type as fully as we can is difficult. There is one basic type, and you are basically a type 5. And it says here, it describes you as the investigator. Ah, yes. Basically, it says you are the cerebral, intense type. Perceptive, innovative, secretive and isolated. I'll read it. Tell me when to stop. Five, fives are alert. Good. Fives are alert, insightful and curious, able to concentrate and focus on developing complex ideas and skills. Independent, innovative, inventive, they can also become preoccupied with their thoughts and imaginary constructs. They become detached, yet high-strung and intense typically have problems with eccentricity, nihilism, and isolation. You said life relations? Nihilism. And? Isolation. Isolation, okay. At their best, they are visionary pioneers, often ahead of their time and able to see the world in an entirely new way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true of you. Okay, well, that's interesting. You do have a paradigm dramatic look of the view in a Jungian way that I didn't realize. I mean, that's, that's very true. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, anything more? Yes. Your basic fear 
is being useless, helpless, or incapable. Your basic desire is to be capable and competent. I have suggested that you are a type five with a wing of four, influenced also by number four, and that type is called the iconoclast. Ah, yes. Certainly I'm an iconoclast. <laughs> by, by the way, sure, I'll answer your question at the end, or I'll have uh, Brendan do it. Um, but it, it's a different test from Myers Briggs, so go ahead. So the um, key motivation to possess knowledge, understand the environment, and have everything figured out as a way of defending yourself from threats in the environment. Mm -hmm. Active and scattered. But when you're getting life together, you can become self-confident and decisive. Examples of people like you, the Buddha, Einstein, Oliver Sacks, <laughs> Stephen Hawking, Van Gogh, Monk, George O'Keefe, Dali, Emily Dickinson, Nietzsche, Agatha Christie, James Joyce, the list goes on. Oh my goodness. Harpo Marx. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, has John, who is an anonymous five like you. Being a five means always needing to learn to take in information about the world. A day without learning is like a day without sunshine. Do. This understanding makes me feel in control and in charge of things. I most often learn from a distance as an observer and not a participant. Sometime journey to learn that life must be lived and not just studied. So the implication is it's difficult for a five to understand. To be involved with life, right. you prefer to be observers of life. Ah, yes. You okay. pretty much did my chart. So. <laughs> Why, you five? Come on. Five and a four. Yeah, you might. Well, in fact, this is, this is interesting enough. Um, Bill, your yeah. good friend here, right is similarly, by the look of it, a five with a four wing. Very interesting. Interesting, yeah. So, yeah. so tell me what the, the headline of five is and the headline of four. Well, the headline of five is the investigator. Okay. But the headline of the five with the high influence of type four is iconoclast. Okay. All right, and uh, I took another test, not the Myers-Briggs, but another mm -hmm. test, and I don't remember what it was, but it, it said that I was very high on experimentation. Mm -hmm. I mean, just off the charts compared to everything mm -hmm. else, very mm -hmm. experimental. And I guess uh, 950 some videos suggest that that's probably true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, so Bill has the same chart. It looks like it to me it's so far, and what he's what he's just seen, what I'm looking at for the very first time, he scores more highly as a five than you. Um, but um, four is most likely his wing. So what have you got in six? Yeah, four is more likely his wing too. So yeah. Yep. Yeah, so sure. Sherry, I guess we'll all agree that I am in a kind of quest. If nothing else, I'm certainly that. Um, so Sherry asked the que question. Um, first of all, Grenade makes the comment, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> okay, well, maybe. Um, and Sherry gives the three descriptors as open-minded, intelligent, and affable. And... Sherry asked the question, is this similar to the marriage Briggs test or completely different? It's very similar. Very similar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I don't know much about it. Can you give us a, a sense of other, other types that someone might be? Uh, I am a type 9, uh, and I'm a peacemaker. Uh, it means that at my my best, I can be creative and help and, uh, um, um, build a, a way where everybody feels comfortable and um, 
uh, a dynamic that makes people want to be sociable and uh, to work together. At, at my worst, I can be a people pleaser. I can be highly anxious. So, uh, so are you uh, an ENFP? Yeah. In my right? Myers Briggs, correct. I, I guessed it. That you are, you're very good. I thought I told you that. No, you guessed it. No, I guessed it. Yeah, ENFP. that's right. Okay. That's exactly what I am. I'll just go through the um, the nine types that well, people could be. Do you want to eat your dinner and we can come back to that? Yeah, and if you like, you can, you can read the nine types for that lady. These are the, the basic descriptions of the nine types. Okay, all right. Terrific. Okay, so... Brendan has assigned me the, the description of the nine types, so I'll do that now. Uh, NFP, T for me. Okay. Um, and I'm INTP. So, anyway, type one is principled, purposeful, self controlled, and perfectionist. Is there an overall description of this? That, that's, there, there is. On, you have to look on the website. It's called. The Enneagram Institute. Okay, the Enneagram Institute. Okay, all right. So, type one is principled, purposeful, self-controlled, and perfectionist. Type two is generous, demonstrative, people-pleasing, and possessive. Type three is adaptable, excelling, driven, and image-conscious. Type four is expressive, dramatic, self-absorbed, and temperamental. Mm. <laughs> Type 5 is perceptive, innovative, secretive, and isolated. Type 6 is engaging, responsible, anxious, and suspicious. Type 7 is spontaneous, versatile, acquisitive, and scattered. Type 8 is self-confident, decisive, willful, and confrontational. And Type 9 is receptive, reassuring, complacent, and resigned. And so just while Brendan gets into his dinner here, I'll just give you the benefit of my test here. So the, the ones that I am high in, seven and eight, uh, eight, uh, or, yeah, seven and eight, seven, Spontaneous, versatile, acquisitive, and scattered. Type 8 is self-confident, decisive, willful, and confrontational. Uh, but um, the highest was type 5, which was perceptive, innovative, secretive, and isolated. Now, now um, why... I, I'm just curious, uh, Brendan, I agree with the iconoclasts, but how, how does it work? Because type four is one of my lower scores here, so mm -hmm. how does that work? Well, perhaps you're not as wed to your eccentricity as the average uh, type four might be. When a type four is falling apart, uh -huh. they cherish how peculiar they are. Oh, see. <laughs> so what does that mean when you get 22? Yeah, but I mean, what is what is it? Why is it a wing? It's a wing because it's it's in the same area. Uh, because it's a wing because they are next to each other, I and see. the personality types are influenced by each other. There's a continuum one through one through nine. Right. And so uh, five being next to four, he didn't join the lines. So he just put numbers. I'm suggesting that your wing is a type 4 because your other um, number that was next to 5, which is 6, you score really low on. Okay, but th this is next to 5, and that's no. very low well, also. In a, in a circle, in, that's in your group, in your instinctive group, you're the withdrawn type. Hmm. So I'm introverted. Right, okay. I guess this is meaningful. And... So, Nancy, welcome. Uh, so, so y you have to you give us three words that describe me based on what you know about me. 
no, no, no fouling. Knowledgeable. Okay. Knowledgeable. Um, uh, conversational. Mm -hmm. And um, I committed. Committed, okay. Yeah. Good. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's four years. Pardon? Yeah. That's a big commitment. Yeah. Oh, that committed. Yeah, well, that's committed. That is committed. We committed to like an institution. Yeah. He's already been through that. It's in the military. And we, we, we have five people besides me at the table and ten online. So that's a good sign. Um, not always the same ten, probably, but anyway. Uh, here, they're right here on Brendan's, or Brendan, it's Brendan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yours. Oh, it's an it, it, it's, uh, it's online. It's online. Yeah. I'm just going to take a picture of that. Sure. Yeah. That's right, Enneagram Institute. Okay, so it's the Enneagram Institute if you want to check this out. And so what do you do with this now, Brendan? Please. Well, what, what I do with it and what I did with my students in um, Catholic Charities who were gentlemen who had ended up in jail because of the uh, because of cr crimes committed okay. why do you commit a crime why, do, why does often it happens because you can see no other way out of a situation mm -hmm. or it might be just a visceral reaction to, some, to something The point about um, the Enneagram, I think, is to help you to be conscious of your ego and, co and conscious, period, mm -hmm. so that you can see yourself for who you are, not just, not just uh, react to everything like some kind of, I don't know, lion. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got to be able to see yourself, mm -hmm. identify yourself, identify your personality, which is not yourself. You are not your personality, mm -hmm. and if you make the distinction between the two, then I think you can work on your personality and become your best self. That's mm -hmm. the point of it. Yeah. Self actualization. So, is there a, is the distribution for prisoners the same as the general population? Yes. Okay. So it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've been reading this book this week. Oh, that's the other one. I was Creation reading. of Consciousness. It's a terrific book. Yeah. Um, but um, one of the first things that Dr. Edinger says in this book is that the main objective of all forms of psychotherapy is to increase consciousness. Yeah. That's the objective. Mm -hmm. And so I guess this test would fall into that category. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's what yeah. Jung says. Too. I'm hoping the rest of you are still out there. I, um, I'm trying to follow on my own other iPhone, and it seems to be stuck. And so that's not very hopeful. But anyway, um, it seems like we still have eight people online. So. The Enneagram Institute, I guess, or is there? It has a varied history. There's a variety of. of, of uh, it's very much linked, I think, to the development of the conscious um, consciousness. It's very much linked to the develop of development of mental health studies from the Jung and Freud, you know, from the early um, century, from the turn of the 20th century. I mean, it's just part of that way. This thing was only developed really in the 90s. So it's part of that. So we're all increasing. So yes. Yeah. So we're really all just increasing our consciousness mm -hmm. through all these various things, which is interesting. So, so pardon? Ah, yeah, History of Consciousness, yeah. And did you start to read it? No, it just came. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, about this one, The Art of Young. Oh, you got that one? I got that one, yeah. Oh, it's a terrific book. get the red book. 
Yeah. Okay, could I borrow that just a minute to show to the people here? Um, okay, so this is the book that I forgot to bring tonight, but, but Nancy has it, uh, The Art of C.G. Young. I hope it's showing front forward for you because it's showing backward for me. But in any case, it's, uh, uh, it's a terrific book, and it has a lot of unique... Uh, images in it that Dr. Jung did during his lifetime, and he did a lot of art, a lot of art. Um, and he did it in masonry, he did it in painting, uh, he did it by in carving wood. Uh, so, for example, in, at an early age, he carved this wooden snake. Uh, that was one that he did, and he was he was really into snakes. And uh, he never got out of that. No, he never did. <laughs> and he he carved this uh, atom victu. Uh, and in this image here, you can see his daughter standing next to this carving that he had uh, he had cast after he carved it in wood, and he put it in his yard. So this is. This is his young daughter with it. Um, and so that's Adam Vicku was a kind of wise old man. Um, but he was an outstanding artist throughout his life. And thank you, Nancy. Uh, that, pardon? Yeah, thank you, because I had intended to bring my copy and then I said it. I set it aside and didn't pick it up. Okay, so we were talking about consciousness and how uh, all these things, all psychotherapy is about trying to increase consciousness. And so I brought for everybody a copy of this five, seven stages of consciousness. And um, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I, I have plenty. All right. And um, what is going on here? I'm, I'm going to see if I can reconnect here. Um, and uh, Okay, so the seven stages of consciousness. So one of the things I was going to talk about was Kundalini, but in order to get to that, I have to get through synchronicity and a few other things. And so we've talked about the seven stages before, but... Uh, well, let, let, me, let me give you the synchronicity, okay? Because here's... here's this is really weird. Okay, so here's Murray Stein's book, Jung's Map of the Soul, an introduction. And this book is the basis of an, the recent album by BTS, which is now the, uh, as of May 1st, it was named the best group in the world Whoa. in pop music, okay? So the best group in the world, and they're currently completing a uh, world tour where they've filled stadia in the Rose Bowl, Soldiers Field, um, Giant Stadium, which is, I forget what it's called, um, in New Jersey. Then they went down to Brazil and did two concerts, and then they went to Wembley this weekend and did two concerts. And it was awesome, I, because they live streamed the, the Wembley concert, and it was awesome. It, and, you know, they filled that place, and then, you know, they've got all this pyrotechnics going, and all, all uh, it was Saturday. It was uh, 2.30 in the afternoon here. It was 7.30 at night in Wembley. Yeah, and uh, they sold... 24 million tickets to that online. So they had 24 million people online at about 30 bucks a pop. And, pardon? 
to watch it live, plus the people that were in the stadium, right? And uh, I really enjoyed it. I I wish that I had been at the stadium because you would have gotten a lot more of the energy of the event. But you know, it was it was great. And then afterward, they uh, it was very touching how each one of them came out on the runway after the concert and interacted with the audience. It was very moving, and uh, and just shows how good they are at connecting with people and they've really done that uh so uh i guess because i paid to watch it i can watch it again um so i don't know can i uh i watched it on my computer but uh so we'll see i have to check that out and if I can, maybe we'll have a session at my place where we can watch the concert. It'd be interesting to see. Uh, so, so you're you you've seen them now, and, and yeah. So anyway, um, so we're BTS fans now. But anyway, they were did their new album. Pardon. What this book? Yeah. Okay. And and so on. I listened to it a couple of times on Audible years ago, but because of BTS, then I went back to it, and I really focused on what Dr. Stein was talking about, which is these seven stages of consciousness, which is this list. Okay, and I will create a handout subfolder in the group Dropbox so that if you are in our Dropbox, uh, you will have an access to this list. Um, but basically, uh, let me just go through the stages of consciousness very quickly, and then I'm going to talk about what I wanted to talk about tonight, which is the Kundalini aspect of it. Um, so primitive consciousness is participation mystique which is primitive in the sense that you don't know you're separate from the environment. It's like uh, being in a herd of gazelles when you're a gazelle, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> or being in a herd of elephants when... being connected mom. Yeah, you remember being connected. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so you're not separated from that. But then... Uh, at some stage, you realize that your mother and father are the best father and mother in the world, right? And I, uh, I certainly, they're gods and, well, they are giants at that age, of the, between three and five years old. And so that's stage two. And uh, I, I remember specifically at age five, I was driving across the country with my mother and I was the oldest of three children and she was doing all the driving because my father had gone to Alaska ahead of us and so she drove 25 year old woman just think of this 1952 she drove three children the youngest of whom was nine months old all the way from Philadelphia to Seattle. <laughs> That's back in the days when filling stations were few and far between. Right, and and she no drove a no car seats. Right. Well, no no seat belts, no car seats, and and we drove across the Badlands, you know, across across uh, South Dakota and Montana. It was better than the wagons. Yeah, it was a little better than the wagons, but I, I specifically remember uh, at that time, one of, one of the things that she was doing was at night, she was washing my sister's diapers in the, in the sink of the motel, and so in the morning, I would take the diapers and hold them out the window to uh, dry them, right? And one time I, I just got this urge, you know, the shadow yeah. urge, and I let the thing go, and so I said to her, I, I let it go, and she says, oh, don't worry, and I remember looking up at her, and just thinking, my God, I'm in the car with a goddess, I mean, I didn't think it in the, in terms of goddess, per se, but I, I just thought, here is this, and she, yeah, she didn't stop, she didn't, 
get angry or anything, and it just was amazing. Okay, so the religion uh, or rationality itself, and, it, and so it's totally rational, and uh, unfortunately that has run thin, and so um, that led to stage four, which is modernity, uh, and the reason for that is that over the 500 years from the time of Galileo, uh, and uh, Sharon says the second night at Wimley was uh, very amazing. Uh, yeah. And um, so, the, but there'll be more. There's going to be one in the middle of June in Korea but you can watch it online around June 15th. But it's, there's a app called VLive, VLive. Yeah, and if you, uh, you know, just look up VLive on the internet and Google, um, then you get it and then you can find the, then you have to plug into the BTS channel of that because it's for all the, the K-pop groups, but but anyway, then you can watch live, um, cool. and they're going to do a special concert around the 15th of June, if I recall correctly. Okay, but what happened at the time of the so-called Enlightenment, the Enlightenment was not so enlightened. Um, and Sherry says that on VLive, the boys published chats and things like the chats that we're seeing now here and so um, but in in the year we we had the enlightenment so called but it was really the scientific method waking up from religion religiosity okay and so in other words we were proving that a lot of the so-called myths of Christianity, for example, were not really true. People started to question the virgin birth and, and, and resurrection and all those things. And uh, the more we learned about the science, uh, science, the more we doubted all these myths, right? Or the, you know, the stories of uh, Abraham, you know, having the vision from God about you know, sacrificing the goat instead of Isaac and that sort of thing. And um, and so, over 500 years, the scientific method kept punching holes in the Christian myths, and so that resulted in the 20th century to lots of agnostics and atheists, and a lot of people leaving the church. And so then we get to a stage that we haven't really gotten going in, and that stage is uh, a religious experience. So once you've had uh, a religious experience, you no longer have to believe. Okay, in other words, you know, right? You know. And you don't have to be a member of the church, that's right. However, you know, what Jung said is that we can't throw away our religions because our our psychic history is based on Christianity and Judaism basically and and so it's wrong to throw out the religions and that you know if you went back to the religions then they have a system that can bring you along and so what I noticed is um, well, I noticed that after I became a Buddhist, I became a better Christian, okay? And after I became a Jungian, I became a better Christian and a better Buddhist, okay? And, and so nowadays, I can go to a Christian service and find it very moving, I often do, and I can go to a Christian or a Buddhist meditation class and find that very moving in a different way, but also very moving. And um, so anyway, um, I've put online for those outside of the table here, uh, 
on a playlist called Breakthroughs to the Unconscious. I've put online several of my religious experiences because I actually caught a few on video. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and on on camera, so there's actually photographs of them. Okay. And so most people can't you know, most, I think most people have these experiences, but they don't know what they are. They're numinous. They don't know what they are, and so they just kind of ignore them. But mine have been so bang over the head because they've been so closely related to, to um, religion that I've had to pay attention to them in that context. And as I say, I've had many. So I, in my view, you could think back on, you know, what are the things that you remember from your youth? And those are the things that are probably numinous to you. Those were special moments in your life that are telling you something. And okay, maybe when you're five years old, you can't really appreciate it. But, you know, I certainly realized the anima when I when I realized that my mother was a goddess I certainly had some idea of of the anima unconsciously right and so both women I've married were basically in her model okay in that model of my mother uh, and I think a lot of men uh, might react in that way. I don't know, but I think it might be true. And um, so anyway, um, the point is that if you have a religious experience, and I've put some examples online, then you know. You no longer have to believe. It's not a question of I believe in, do you believe in God? They're, they're on the channel under a playlist called Breakthroughs to the Unconscious. Okay, and the reason it's Breakthroughs to the Unconscious is because you're trying to find a connection between your ego and the collective, okay, which is in the unconscious. So there's a personal unconscious, but there's also the collective unconscious. And, and so you can understand um, you know once it happens to you then you know it's bigger than your ego it's bigger than you I mean you know there's, there's this classic um, this classic image that's been on many movies where uh, the light of God will come down on someone, right? And, you know, they have this inspirational moment, and that's in so many movies. It's so archetypal. And it literally happened to me. I mean, I sometimes I get a little down, and one day I went over into the Naval Academy Chapel, and I can't show you the picture right now, but I can before we leave tonight, after I turn this off. But... Um, but I went over to the chapel. I, it was early in the morning. It was like 10.30 in the morning. So nobody was in the chapel. And there were, if there were any lights on, I, I think there were no lights on. It was only window light. Okay. But it, that was mainly through stained glass windows, right? So I sat down on one arm of the chapel. It's, it's the cathedral of the Navy. So it's in the shape of a cross like all cathedrals right and so I was facing to the left side and I was facing the Tiffany window there's a Tiffany window there that's stained glass right and it's a it's there's an image of Christ and Christ is holding up this mandala the sun which is a mandala and so I was sitting there you know very dejected and down and all of a sudden this light came upon me okay it just totally lit me up but nothing else in the chapel only me it was like a spotlight on me and I looked up at it 
and there were even striations of light like you see in move, movies and things right and sometimes you see it out outside and it's like biblical sky we call it biblical sky and so but that was inside the chapel i go i, I look up at it and i say wow nobody is ever going to believe this unless i take a picture of it so I took a picture of it, and then I turned the I took turned my iPhone around. And by that time, my whole demeanor had changed. I had this big grin on my face, and I took a selfie of myself. And so you can see how dark it is behind me, and you can see the, these rays of light coming into the chapel, and everything else is dark. And and so and it's at exactly the right time for me for. A religious experience. And it was, you know, I'm in the chapel for crying out loud, and and, and it, it's this classical uh, image that you see in movies. And I say, my God, this is a religious experience, right? And the other time I was, uh, pardon? Wow. Right. And, and yeah, I was aware of it because I'm sitting there and I'm all dejected. And all of a sudden, this light just comes on me. And I look up, and here's the stained glass window with Jesus and the mandala, right? And then there's another window there, and the light is coming through this other window like a spotlight. And it's only on me in that whole room. And there's 2,000 seats in that chapel. That's only on me. Okay, so that's a synchronicity, okay? Um, because okay yeah it's the sun going across the sky goes across the sky every day but i'm not there every day at that right time and i happen to be there at that right time in that spot and you know that's that's just once it happens to you and my demeanor just changed it was like the grace of god came down upon me in that moment and you know, I just, I walked out of that chapel without a, a care in the world after that happened. And um, the opposite happened to you? Okay. Yeah, I was about four years old. I was out in the front yard making a snowman. Uh, I guess, I, I know, I'm not sure what happened, but suddenly it got very bright. And I suddenly became extremely self-conscious. It scared me, and I ran into the house. Is that right? Yeah. And I later I decided the sun must have come out from behind a cloud or something. Uh -huh. but it, uh, it really startled me. And how old were you? Four. <laughs> you were four? Okay. Yeah. I hadn't, hadn't started school yet. It's early memory. Okay, so... It was interesting. Exactly. <laughs> Well, so at the other end of that was my experience with Mephistopheles. Okay, and I think you all probably know about that, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat it, but you can find it on the YouTube channel, and probably you all know about it too. So, um, And so that's the opposite side of the spectrum. And the other one that I thought was the most amazing one was when I was reading Answer to Job. Uh, yeah, so I'm reading Answer to Job, paragraph 746, and there's this part of it that says, um, you know, sometime, you know, something numinous will happen to us, you know, that, right? So it, it says that, and I, that's the beginning of this video, something numinous happens to us, and then two minutes later, these jets from the navy these f-18s fly over the naval academy football game and just announce themselves right and the very next thing that i'm reading in answer to job which is the beginning of paragraph 747 is after the apocalypse we know that god has to be feared um, as well as loved okay and I'm taking the Jets as an announcement that God has to be feared because this, the moment that that came through was, was just uncanny. It said something numinous happens to us at the beginning of it. Two minutes later, the Jets fly over, and I'm right at this point in answer to Job where I'm reading about how we have to fear God. 
And I go, oh my God. And, and so that's, that video is on the YouTube channel. It's worth watching. Okay, so the next level is synchronicity. And so the point about BTS, the point about BTS was that um, I read this book. I had read it twice before on Audible, uh, but because of BTS doing that album, I go back and reread it, and I find this thing about the stages of consciousness. And this stages of consciousness thing is the key. It's the key for what religions need. Okay. Because, because the, the religious experience, right, um, if people have the religious experience, then they're going to be more inclined to go back to the churches, right? And so the synchronicity is, you know, I had already read this book, and I hadn't rocked it on these stages of consciousness from reading the book. I'd read it twice on the Audible, and all of a sudden now, because the this band from Korea did this album, I go back to it, re reread it, and I say, "Oh my God!" And and then I realize that this this is really about stages of consciousness, and and Jung was trying to get people to understand that we have to get to a new level of consciousness in order to. Um, keep our morality going, okay? Because people won't people won't stay moral because of the Ten Commandments after World War II and World War One, right? After the 20th century, we killed 175 million people. There's a lot of Christians killing Christians, and so where's yeah, so where's the morality in that? And so, but if we have a, an experience like this, then we say, oh, maybe there's something to this, right? And then maybe we have to think about it in a different way. And so that's another stage of consciousness. But the synchronicity is this next level of consciousness. And, um, don't you think sometimes we just read a book that we say we read it, but we don't read it for meaning? Yeah, we don't quite, we don't, yeah, if we keep reading it, yeah. But sometimes you read it at the level you're at, and then you come back to the level, it's more. Right. It's more meaning. So, it's more reading. Yeah, it's like, you read what fits, and that's what you, where did you stop on Pete, or on I st I'm, I'm going to peak now. I'm going to peak now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> everybody get ready for peak, right? Okay, so I'm talking about Kundalini. So this is C.G. Young, um, the psychological, what? the psychology of Kundalini Yoga uh, by C.G. Young. It's based on a seminar he gave in 1932. And it's edited by Sonu Shandasani, who is the editor of the Red Book. And um, I'm not going to teach you all of Kundalini tonight, okay? Because Kundi, Kundalini is widely taught in gyms in the United States. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, gym teachers, physical physical fitness teachers who have learned, uh, I, I would call it Hinduism light, and they do various kinds of yoga in gyms. All, you know, they do it all, all over Annapolis. And one of the ones they do is Kundalini. Okay, and so the idea of Kundalini is that you have a serpent that's coming up in your, up your backbone starting at the most base levels, at the most instinctual levels, getting up higher and higher to the highest level, which is um, this peak experience. Now, what Dr. Stein says in this book is that Jung didn't think the Westerners could achieve this level. But as I read it, I understand it to be a level that you can experience, okay? And 
the most common way I think that you can experience is, is in lovemaking, okay? And, and so the, the difference is, there's a difference, okay? If it's, if it's just a sexual act, to have a sexual act, and it's going to be over in five minutes or something like that, then that's not a peak experience. That, that's just an animal experience. But if you make love in such a way that you raise the consciousness of your partner to a higher and higher and higher level until, um, you know, basically you're you're filled with light and it doesn't you don't have to have a full sexual experience for example i remember when i was in college my senior year in college i would be making out with my uh girlfriend of the time who became my first wife and not the one i'm with now but nonetheless it was good okay and we were we were in the last class of the victorian age so we didn't do it back then okay however we 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 made out for it <laughs> nonetheless and and so i do recall that we would get to a stage and and we'd make out for like eight hours straight right and we would we, we would gradually get higher and higher in this leveling to the point where it, even though it was pitch dark in the room it was like being in an operating theater with the operating lights on you and and it was so bright in the room and and so that's the kind of experience i'm thinking about that it must be like that um and uh but i'm happy to hear uh bills and other ideas about that we're, to, we're talking about peak experience now okay and and so one of the ways that dr jung got a bad name in the 60s was because people that wanted to do drugs thought they were going to use him as an excuse right because he was talking about peak experiences and so on was who maslow okay all right so tell us about that oh you don't got to go back 50 years this is you said peak experience i think of maslow abraham maslow right um and you know i used to know the whole sequence uh, you know, he had levels, oh, but, and the lowest is security, you know, right. food, food, the five things, and then, right. uh, but I don't remember, you know, right. at the moment, without right. notes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, the other one is psychoid layer, right? The psychoid layer, it, uh, well, they talk about it in Jungian analysis, uh -huh. that develops between an analyst and the analyst okay. where they it's get a into container a, yeah it's a container and they get into a conversation and everything else drops away and they're in a space between one another and so it's very much like what we have right now going on in this group okay especially between you and me right now okay because for the last 10 minutes you haven't been you haven't been conscious that we're even in a restaurant right mm -hmm. and i haven't been i'm trying to explain something to you mm -hmm. and so we've had a connection between the two of us that's that it's an example it's it's uh it's a connection where we're communicating at a different level mm -hmm. and everything else in the world falls away mm -hmm. okay and it happens in a good conversation with anybody I mean, with, with a girlfriend that you're out to so, tea with or something so we're not talking about something that you're interested in that's gross. and and you're you're talking about that and everything else just disappears. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, I remember, and John may remember this, Bill may remember this, where the first few sessions that we had, there was uh, this beautiful psychotherapist that was, was here. She's moved out of town now. 
but um, she came in and she fit my animal. Okay, she was exactly the same as my image from my mother that I was talking about earlier. Okay, and and it later turned out that she was a sex therapist. I didn't know that, but at the time, okay. But anyway, I, I start to talk to her in the group meeting. There are 11 people in the room, but it was like a tunnel developed between the two of us. And it, it's like this, this uh, fog of white formed around us. And I'm looking down this tunnel to her and she's looking at me and we're interacting and you know there's 10 other people in the room none of them saw that but that's what we saw we were at a different layer of consciousness pardon she as well she as well yeah okay right and and so nothing ever happened from that by the way <laughs> just to clarify <laughs> however um However, it, it's one of these experiences that I'm talking about. And so that's a, a peak, it seems to me that's a peak experience that we're talking about, which is you get to a, a state, a psychological state, where everything else falls away and something is going on. I mean, when, when we're in this group, or any time that I'm doing anything on my YouTube channel, okay, when I'm interacting with people and talking to them, I'm, I'm in this state, right? I'm in that space. And they're getting, you're getting, everybody's getting what's coming from myself. It's not coming from my ego, because my ego doesn't even know this stuff, right? But myself does. And... And, and so it comes from my deep unconscious, and it's conveyed to your deep unconscious, to, the, to this extent that I bring you into a, sort of a hypnotic space, think of it as a hypnotic space, um, then, then we share, um, and, and we share not only consciously, but unconsciously as well. Well, it comes from uh, it comes from a, a Hindu. It's a Hindu word, I believe. Yeah, and so anyway, so yeah, sure. I, I, okay, so we're going to hear from Debbie about Kundalini now. Okay, go for it. It's not the Yong Yao. It's the Kundalini Reiki. So I'm attuned to Kundalini Reiki. Okay. And Kundalini is um, when you are attuned, it's the serpent that goes up all of your chakras right. and clears out. Crown, right. The cra right, from the root to the crown. But I was just reading and it said here that um, Jung said most the main activity of most people is in the lower three chakras. From the root, no, well, I mean, yeah. Those and, are and as a, of as, and as a healer, the... as a healer, the root and the heart chakra, which is not one of the lower threes, are the most vulnerable. If you would Google that, because of course, don't we all come a lot from our heart? Mm -hmm. But our safety, um, environment, you know, fundamental needs are in our root chakra. Yeah, well, that's our instinct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the so the significance about that is that we need our instincts. Okay, that our instincts. We wouldn't be anything without them. Correct. We wouldn't be conscious. We'd be stones, and we need our unconscious, and that's the self. That's the what Jung called the two million year old man, but it's really the three point five billion year old man. It's it's the instinct that's developed from our first ancestor that was a single celled organism or not many cells. 
Okay, I, I mean, I, I don't know when sex was invented, okay, but it was invented by protozoa. <laughs> right, the patent has long expired on sex, but we're the descendants of creatures that have successfully reproduced and survived to reproduce for three and a half billion years. And, and so that in itself is an incredible miracle. But the fact is that it's unconscious, but it's a, it's a way that this unconscious self has kept not only us, but all of our ancestors alive. Back to the time even you know, before there was human consciousness. I mean, I, I've been pointing out archetypes that go back at least 500 million years. Um, you know, the archetype, the picture of the, of the, uh, the eagle. Well, the archetypes develop somewhere along that line, okay? Well, the archetypes are, um, I'm not sure, is it the archetype that changes? Because the archetypes represent sort of a, a uh, Something. image of the instincts. And how right. the archetype uh, is constellated depends on where you are in the history of your culture and so forth. In other words... And your species. Well, yeah, but I'm saying if we're Homo sapien, and if you're in, if you're a, a, a Roman or a, you know, two thousand years ago, and you're a modern, your archetypes are going to be a little different. Uh, well, they're going to play a little different. Maybe. I, get I mean, mothers were mothers in Roman times. Right? Okay. And, yeah, I'm, I'm and not saying it well. Ever, ever since sex was developed, invented by protozoa, not by humans. Ever since sex was invented, there have been mothers, right? But if you were, if you were just living in, let's say, the god images of uh, of the Romans, for example, yeah, right, okay, it, you wouldn't be able to discuss um, things like uh, modern philosophy, right? You wouldn't because have the archetype wouldn't be a, would not serve that. There would have to be modifications, at least to the surface of the archetype, which is the the front face of the uh, of the instinctual clusters, the cluster of instincts that, that right. generates it. So in other words, I guess what I'm saying is that the instincts could shift a little so that you're always, it's always constellating uh, to reflect your time that you're in. So the, Surely. So, right. so it's so. like the God image can change the archetypes. Precisely. I so, mean, we're not talking like well, something major, cool. like becoming a, a bicycle and a car or something. We're talking, you know, something more subtle. Than that. Right. But, uh, yeah. So, anyway, one of the images of the God image is the mandala. And Debbie found a picture of the mandala that's 50,000 years old. Okay. And it's, and it's found in Australia in a cave. And it's huge. I have a picture of it on my iPhone. I'll show it to you later. It's quite impressive. We have to excuse ourselves. Okay. Peace. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you all. Nice, nice to see you tonight. Yeah. 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 Nice seeing you, Debbie. Nice to see you, Debbie. Thank and, you. And thanks for looking up about the Kundalini. I appreciate that. Let me know how useful it is. Yeah. Take it easy Okay, I'm going to look back at the at the chat now. Here. Okay. So, uh, Sherry, I don't know what the boys were surprised about it. Uh, day night two of Wembley. You'll have to tell us about that. Um, and she says uh, people are also reading Damien. This is who uh, this is who walk away from Omalas and the map of the soul. It's just brilliant how they educate and motivate through their art and entertainment. That's obviously what I'm very excited about. And. Uh, and there is a book uh, that was done especially by Dr. 
a sign call, called Map of the Soul Persona, the same name as the album, and it is dedicated to BTS, so I urge you to get that. I've got a copy of it, and it's a beautiful little book. And, uh, and Sherry says, talking about the seventh, the peak experience, it sounds like tantric approach to lovemaking. I agree, it probably is that. Uh, definitely is that, in fact. And so the B generation wanted someone to point the finger at for their drug use. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And and so Jung got blamed for for the fact. I mean, there there was this interview between Jordan Peterson and Camille Paglia. Okay, and so Paglia says, well, all the great intellectuals of the 60s died because they fried their brains on drugs. <laughs> well, some of them are getting old now. Who, who was? Leary. Oh, Leary. Yeah, maybe so. But, you know, who survived was his buddy, uh, you know, the here now guy. I forget his name. I don't know. He was a fellow uh, psychologist. I think they were both at Harvard. Timothy Leary? Yeah. yeah. Timothy Leary? But his, his buddy went on and became, you know, like a Hindu or something. You know, uh, yeah. Focused on meditation. He's, he may still be alive. But. Right. It's the diet. Right. Okay. So, but it, but it is, focusing on meditation only isn't the right answer. Um, and so Sherry says, it's like when you feel time is slowed and sped up when you are with someone. Absolutely. And uh, I read somewhere, somebody says, you know, when you're in that state, the dogs don't bark. You don't hear them anyway, if they do. Um, and, you know, when you're making love. But, um, well, it's true. If you're making love, making art, you don't believe it. And, uh, and so thank you for joining us, Sherry. Pardon, what is that? Or when I'm listening to... Time speeds up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it actually slows down. It slows down. <laughs> I agree with that. Oh, the, these sessions are too long. No, I'm kidding. Have more wine. <laughs> so anyway, um, Camille Paglia um, blamed... Um, drugs on, on the loss of these intellectuals from the 60s, or m many of them, but I, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Yeah. I, you know, that's, which intellectuals? Yeah, which intellectuals? And yeah, most of the intellectuals were already in their 60s and 70s, because the 20s and 30s, I would consider intellectual, I just call them all the crazy kids. Crazy kids, yeah, and, and so, but unless they were political, there were some political. Types. But you think that now the University of Maryland is back experimenting with psychedelics? Is it with psychedelics or it's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. It's, it's not just them; it's it's all across the country. Yeah. And and so what is what is their purpose? Are they trying to generate a, a well, false it's, it's peak what experience? We understood at the time, it accelerates stuff. Okay. The thing is, is you need someone. Uh, a lot of uh, you can't be out there throwing a frisbee, smoking a joint, and and you know just checking out the legs going by. You know, right. <laughs> You've got to have a serious side to you, and so a lot of people need. And I, it's helpful, I think, for anybody to go in with people that are experienced, and at least, and most of all, people who aren't judgmental, right. who who will allow you to. Uh, Ex explore and uh, experience things in a safe environment. Right. But that's true of that's true of therapy in general. Sure. You know, you've got to have a, a container, the container. Right. The call right. the. Anyway. Right. And and so that brings up. So it just accelerates. And it. it brings up an important warning caveat that we have to give about Jungian psychology and and following this channel in, in that you can be exposed to the archetypal layer and it can start things going in your psyche and you need to be it really helps to know something about Jungian psychology if that starts to happen and this is what Edinger's some sort of channel a 
way to uh, to get it out there where you can see it, look at it, and where it's meaningful and reflected. Right. And sometimes you can do that on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's what happened to me when I wrote my novel. Is is that because I knew something about Jungian psychology, and I knew that it had been constellated by Estes's book, Women Who Run with the Wolves. I read that book, and then it kicked off some things in my psyche, which I didn't know what was going on. It just happened but it, it, you know fortunately I just instinctually put it down in writing yeah there was a discipline involved right the thing that bothered me in the 60s and I wrote about it in, the, in a lot of times in my English classes where the kids that were out there just it was like Mardi Gras for them every day uh, they, they didn't there wasn't a serious fun in it yeah, uh, and and so they didn't know how they were, what they were doing. Right? Well, some of us wanted to go up to the edge and look over, but some of them, didn't, they just didn't know even know what the edge was. <laughs> they just wanted to come un unglued. You know? right. I think they wanted to shake mom and dad off or something. Yeah, they probably did. But you gotta know what's going to be on the other side, right? Well, I think I don't know. I didn't have that much of a mind that okay, thing to so do with. The official position of this YouTube channel is that you can do this without drugs, and drugs are not recommended by this YouTube channel. We are not mental health professionals, and so except what was the, what was except the name you, of the book? which book? Uh, uh, run, run with wolves. Women who run with the wolves. Women who run with the wolves. Right. By Clarissa Pincolastes. And that did something to you. Yes, it, it constellated a, a Jungian process going on in my unconscious, which emerged as a novel, and it was an eight-month visioning period. You novel. Yes, and it was an eight-month visioning period when I had to play out the archetype. And, and the thing about archetypes is once they start in you, they don't stop until they've played through. It's like, it's like hitting the jukebox and the music starts to play, but you can't stop it until it's done. So it's your red book, basically. It was your expressing the archetype. Well, th that was a chapter of my red book, <laughs> let's say. But it was... What's your book, Skip? It's called... Uh, Mako, M E I K O, Memoirs of a Woman. Did you read the whole Women Who Run with the Wolves? Yes, I read it. I read it cover to cover in two in two days. I put it aside and picked up another book, but I was I was really fascinated by some of the, the mythology she talked about. Right. I was more into what the story she told. It didn't it didn't resonate at a deep level. One of, my, one of my, one of my, it's it's kind of weird in a way, I guess. But I've always been fascinated with the feminine, and so I've always that's everything, everything that had to do with women. I was always reading about it, and so that was one of those books, and I yeah. read it, and and uh, the Yabba, what is it, the Yabba God, the the the, the one, the house with the feet, who was. Oh, uh, Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga, yeah. Baba Yaga. And all of that, uh, those images and stuff, of course, settled in. And that, that was wonderful stuff. But I was just screaming through things. So, you know, it's like, that's why I like Neumann, because he always talks about the feminine so much. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've always associated myself with him. You know, in, in high school, I would hang around, well, I'm basically an artist. So I would hang around people that other people wouldn't hang around. Mm -hmm. You know, my guys would get friends would go, that guy's gay, and I go, I don't care. He's really interesting to talk to, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, and even my roommate in, in prep school was a gay guy, and nobody knew that. And then they had a 50 year reunion and said, did you hear about Wesley? God, we didn't know that. And I, they said, did you know that? He was your roommate. And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And they, and they said, well, and I said, 
I didn't care. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's, I always said, even, you know, that just whole feminine side of me has always been interesting, though I'm not gay. But mm -hmm. I've always, I've, I've, it's... Well, I mean, the feminine side should be interesting to men, right? Yeah, but it wasn't just that. It was more on a, it was more of a, on a, like a spiritual level. Mm -hmm. What is like a spiritual level? But so. Well, I didn't mean like. Condolence. Yeah. Well, no, but in in my case, I uh, had an experience when I was fifteen where um, we had a Japanese maid. We were living in Japan in a Japanese house. We had a Japanese maid who was seven years older than me, but when you're a 15 year old boy and a 22 year old girl is there, that's nice. yeah. that's awesome, wow, right? That's better than the and, substitute teacher. <laughs> <laughs> She's around the whole time. Right. So, yeah, and she was living with us, right? Yeah. So I asked my father one time, uh, why is she, why is she here? Why, you know, how, how did she get? Why did she get this job? And he said, well. In Japan, women come to Tokyo or to the build-up areas to earn their dowry, quote unquote. Okay. Okay. And so that was that was the total conversation at that time. Okay. But that question, that statement, worked on me for thirty-three years, Why and, the or for thirty years anyway. Why she was there. Yeah. Was well, I mean, this statement from my father oh, okay. that that women come to come to Tokyo to earn their dowry, whatever that is, okay? Then I went back to Japan 16 years later, and I found out a lot about what that means, really, okay? Yeah. Because then I came back as an adult in my 30s, and I worked in industry for, th for five years. I ran a company. I had a lot of women working for me. And I learned a lot about Japanese society, right? Do Including you think your father was uh, was what? In flagrante. No, no. That's not what you learned then. No, no, no. That's not what I. No, no, not at all. I mean, at least he was not with her. <laughs> <laughs> whether he, whether he was with someone else, that's a different question. But but with her, no. Okay. I mean, he just answered this question. So then. I wanted to write a novel, and I had read uh, Michael Crichton's statement in the Wall Street Journal that the way you write a novel is to ask a question. Okay, so I, I said, okay, I'll write a novel. I want to ask a question. What's the question going to be? And so the question that came to my mind is, what would the life of that girl be if she comes to Tokyo to quote unquote earn her dowry at age 15 mm -hmm. and becomes the first woman prime minister of Japan and even beyond that to her retirement. Mm -hmm. And so the novel covers her life from age 15 to age 75. Okay. And it roughly covers wow. the period of my life. She's, she's a contemporary of mine. So, uh, mm -hmm. Although I'm not yet 75, but, but she already achieved did that. Did she know that you were writing about that? Yeah, she did. But you found out about her. You, you, you no, were, well, you sent her a copy. No, that girl never found out about it. But uh, but that book is a is the autobiography of my anima, mm -hmm. basically, and so. There are major segments of the novel that are about Japanese women who I know personally in one way or another. Nice. Okay, let's put it that way. even like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, it pays to stay stay to the end because you never know what kind of uh, revelations that will be emerge. Okay, so uh, peak experiences, Brendan. Besides these, well, I I was interested in what you were saying about um, peak experiences, and as a musician, I often have peak experiences when I know that I'm totally present to the moment, that my whole mind and body is creating, recreating, 
And what kind of a musician are you? I'm a church musician. Church musician. But there are a certain times... So that means you're an organist? Yes. Or? Okay. There are certain times when I'm, particularly when I'm improvising. And when I'm improvising, I am using patterns that I have rehearsed and I know well and I am likely to know where I'm going. But I'm also not sure, it's like you never step into a river in exactly the same way. And you know what I mean? It's that, mm -hmm. it's that thing. So these patterns have worked this way. Are they going to work this way in this context? Okay. And I teach the same thing. I teach jazz piano, same thing, improvisation. It works in this way in the lesson. We're using these structures, right? Um, these, uh, these patterns. But in the context of a live audience or the context of a recording studio, how is it going to work? And I love that peak experience of giving myself completely both to the expectation and the experimentation I think that's a great simultaneously. Example. Yep, that's a great example. Jazz, that's something jazz, jazz just musicians beginning right. to experience before right. I start back playing. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a great example because that's what yeah. all jazz. I don't is. want to learn what mm -hmm. other people do. I only do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. It's getting right. to the point where the patterns. You know, mm -hmm. I've got the pattern so I can go from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have to know what's going to happen. And some days it works just great. Some days mm -hmm. I go, well, I'm practicing. <laughs> right. You know, I'm going to see right. what. But I remember I was in um, India in 1994 at the um, ashram um, of Dom B. Griffiths, who many of your listeners will know um, is a great um, fusion um, of Hindu and Christian tradition. He was a Benedictine monk and uh, became um, a Benedictine Hindu mystic. And what, what is his name? Bede Griffith. B-E-D-E. Okay. B-E-D-E. B -E -D -E. B -E -D -E. Okay. Griffith. And his peak moment, I'll never forget it because I have had similar experiences. He was a um, 14-year-old boy mm -hmm. and he was it was a sports day and he was running cross country with him, you know. And then maybe, then maybe there's a boy 200 yards ahead of him and a boy 200 yards ahead of him. And suddenly he comes around this corner in the middle of the woodland, in the middle of nowhere, and he sees the early morning sun reflected on a spider's web, on the dew of a spider's web, or something like that. And the majesty of that moment just struck him so profoundly that he knew he was in a connection with the divine. And I've had similar ex kind of experiences where I thought, wow. Same way, growing up in the mountains mm -hmm. of East Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, I grew up in that environment. So. Right. So, I, so just out for a walk, you can have that experience. Yeah, yeah. to be in the yeah. case of inexplicable right. beauty. Yeah. It's, it's like um, Walden Pond. Who's yeah. That? Emer not Emerson. Yeah. Huh? Emerson. Emerson. Thoreau. Uh, oh, Thoreau. I'm thinking yeah. Thoreau, I think. Okay. But yeah, I think that's been an integral part of mine. That's always been there. Yeah. You know, right. in, in and, so many and ways. So you have that I mean, sort listening of to Borjak or, yes. <laughs> or Beethoven or, yes. or, right. or a Fox. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and so you can have that kind of an experience just listening, yeah. not sure. not playing. And mm -hmm. I can have it driving home if I listen to the right music. <laughs> right. <laughs> or if I see the right thing. Yeah. Right. I mean one day I'm driving along and and you know, I'm a pretty aggressive driver and somebody goofed and they slipped in front of me and and they went and I went beep and they scooted over and they you know, they were all nervous and I could tell and they just went, you know, and I went, Hey, it's all right. All right. And that was sort of a, I like that connection we made. It was kind of cool. And my daughter was there, so it made it really nice. She got to experience me being a nice guy. <laughs> well, she saw me in a way right. that, uh, that doesn't come up often. How often do you know something like that? I mean, just little things like that are, for me, peak experiences. So they're not all huge. Yeah, well, and people just don't appreciate these they're, they're there, they're having them, they're, those experiences. I mean, Stein in, in this book says he didn't. He thought that the young uh, didn't think Westerners could have a peak experience like this. And, 
and he obviously is skeptical because he's saying it in the way he did. But I think a lot of people have them and just don't appreciate them. Because so you got me going through a whole bunch of them now. Yeah. Another one's the Smoky Mountains. I'm in a stream and it's it's five or ten feet deep, and I'm sitting there in a stream and it's, I I having to keep paddling. You know, mm -hmm. I'm underwater and I'm keeping going, and I look to my side and the fish are right next to me. You know, we're all sitting there wow. staying in one position. Wow. The water, the sun's coming through the water. It's golden and green. Well, you know, beautiful. and it's all beautiful. You know, these yeah. hot rocks, and I can crawl, and the water you can't stand too long because it's so freezing cold. And then you get out of this rock and just lay there. I mean, that whole thing to me is like, experience. yeah, that is. I mean, that was cultivating it as I went along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's like playing a that's like playing a song that you get into and you lose yourself. You yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah, I remember I was snorkeling in Saipan once. And, you know, I just had the, the mask on and the snorkel, and I'm just in the water, I'm on the surface, but I'm watching the, the fish, and, you know, it was really cool. And then I got out and realized I had one hell of a sunburn. Because <laughs> 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 I lost yeah. track of time, and, and I had been doing this for like an hour. And oh, so, my God. so you have to be careful. You can get... You can, you can lose yourself that way. Hmm. Yeah. Nancy, what do you say? I don't think I have any, I've been listening, but I don't think I can come up with an example of one. That I'm sure you have peak experience. Yes, I'm sure there were some, but I'm not coming up with something that is... I, I, I'll, bet, I'll bet 10 will hit you before you go to sleep sure. tonight. Mm -hmm. tonight. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so, the end result of this is that we all have peak experiences and what we don't do is appreciate them necessarily well enough and um, and so we should okay uh, it's not you, the same as aha moment that's not what well it is an aha moment it is but aha moments can be more more on the mental side I think uh, what we were talking about mostly is spiritual yeah, spiritual side. But I think it works both ways. Because right. I get, of course, being a designer, which is well known. Right. And that can either be synchronicity or it can be emotional. And in the case of, in the case of my experience in the chapel, where the light came down on me, um, that's both a synchronicity. It's kind of an aha moment, but it was also a spiritual moment. It was just, uh, it's, it, yeah, it, you, it, you can't believe it. And, you know, it just, it happens and you go, I don't believe this is happening, you know, because I, I felt touched by grace, literally, okay, literally, I was there, I was depressed. I was, you know, there in prayer. The reason I was there was because I was there. We have another one. Pardon? You just, when you, you talk about these, and I just keep... Right, but, but in, in the end, I, you know, when it happened, it was very quick. It probably lasted 30 seconds, but I just... All of a sudden, my attitude just changed. This light came down on me, and I looked up, and I saw this light streaming into the chapel, and I said, what is this? I can't believe this is happening. I have to take it. interesting is you were, you were present in the moment, and you were in a place where, like, i got to capture this. Right. And you were in awareness. Well, it's, right. a living, it. it's, it's a living experience. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, 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 it's just this rich moment of life, of living. Right. And that is the key, I think, is being present. Mm -hmm. If we can be present, I remember a similar situation now where uh, I'd forgotten to take my antidepressant for, I don't know how long, I thought, I must start taking it again. It was a matter of three or four days. And after about one day, I remember I was shaving, and I looked up into the mirror, and I'd been down, I'd been depressed, been fed up. And I looked up in the mirror, and I smiled at myself. And that was it. That's all. I turned around. Everything was fine from then on. Hmm. Interesting. Just being present. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you were going to tell one? 
of the chapel. Uh, well, you just made me think of like I, I, could, I could go on forever. Mm -hmm. that, that one's just I was absolutely totally depressed. I was at Fort Bliss. I was in the military. I never wanted to be there. Uh, I was in El Paso, and I wandered downtown somewhere into this nightclub in the middle of the day. So the doors were open. Nobody was in there. I saw a, a, a stereo player. I just went in, put on Bob Dylan, like a Rolling Stone, and just, it just, it was like, you know, okay, I'll live another day. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, because that's how I felt, like a Rolling Stone. I mean, I had no connection. I was There was mm -hmm. nothing I was connected to. Mm -hmm. I thought El Paso was just a desert to me. You know, it was no but, but, but you were connected to Dylan. But I was... I was mm -hmm. very depressed. Yeah. Uh, well, I, well, the, what? To Dylan, he could have picked any song in that jukebox. Yeah, I maybe, maybe not. There I mean, was the no, experience of listening to yeah. Dylan. That See, for sure. that's right. Because it's, it's, mm -hmm. it, for me, it's never mental. It's I, there's got to be a life experience somehow going on. It's like presence. You got to be. You got to be living it. Mm -hmm. And he came on, and that yeah, just, it has to be an experience. That just riveted me at mm -hmm. the time. You know, it lasted, I don't know how long. But you remember it oh, yeah. now 30 years Viv later. Vividly, yeah. yeah. So that's a that's yeah. a numinous experience, and that's yeah. what we're talking about. And nobody about. ever yeah. came in. I mean, I just sat out there by myself for a while and kind of wandered around and then left. And it was like my moment to be there. Nobody cared. You know, I, I just playing music, yeah, <laughs> playing well, somebody's big In, in terms of being stereo. into the music, Brendan, I was thinking about one time Debbie and I went to the Birchmere. Are you familiar with the Birchmere? Okay, so the Birchmere is a, is a local club that used to be in the, in the um, showroom of an old car dealership. Literally, they, they bought an old car dealership and they put this, this acoustic music mm -hmm. place in it. And they made greasy uh, grilled cheese sandwiches or something like that and you could hear excellent music i mean the top uh country western or bluegrass music in the eastern u.s would come to the birchmere and they still do to this day but but it's like the grand Ole opry which moved from downtown grand Ole opry out to this big place right so the birchmere has now done that but back in the old days when it was still in the in the car dealership one night we went to hear zydeco and we weren't really sure what zydeco was but we get there and so these guys are from new orleans right and you don't say new orleans you say new orleans okay so the guys are from new orleans and they and here we are all sitting around at tables going to watch a concert okay which is what was normal at the birchmere and these guys say, uh, we can't do this. We can't do this concert because, because we always play for people that are dancing. And if you don't dance, we can't do our music. And so they absolutely insisted that we push all the tables aside and then they could do Zydeco. They couldn't you know, it's like a jazz musician, but but without the dancing, yeah, they couldn't that. they couldn't do it. And yeah. so you have to be in the in the experience. So I think music is a terrific example of a yeah. peak experience that people can have, and you can really see people who really get into their music. I mean, Monty Maxwell is one over here yeah. at the Naval okay, Academy. Man. Pardon? He's a lovely man. Yeah, and Inspira inspirational. Yeah, and so Monty Mac Maxwell is this guy who came to Annapolis as a bandsman, as a Navy bandsman, and uh, he took one look at the organ and he said, "That's my organ, and I'm not leaving here." And so he got out of the Navy. He was an enlisted man in the Navy, a bandsman, uh, but he said, I'm going to play this organ, and he's never left. Now he's in his early 60s, I think, but he's been here like 40 years, and it's his organ. And, uh, Is that in the chapel? In the chapel at the Naval Academy, yeah. And, and he's been there as long as I've been here. And, and he, he, he was, 
he had been here 20 years before I came, so <laughs> so he's been a, he, that's been his organ for a long while. Yeah. Uh, so you play jazz when you play an organ and jazz? You play keyboard? No, piano and jazz. What, what do you play? I play piano and jazz. And I play, play organ piano. and piano in church. Uh huh. Cool. Cool. That's interesting. Okay, um, so dates for next time. We need a date for our next session. Here. That's going to be for the eighth. Fourth of July. Yeah. Oh, oh, is that the is that the first Monday mm -hmm. in July? That makes sense. So thank you for being here with us tonight, and um, we're going to tell you what date we're going to do this the next time. It's going to be the first. The first of July is the, is the first Monday in July. Oh, it is. Well, Great. Far enough away from the fourth. Yeah. Okay. So July first. We'll do it July first. Or yeah. Yes, we yes we can. Because twenty seven twenty. Yeah, we can do it July 1st. I will be back. Okay, so thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to sign off because we have two minutes before they throw us out of this place. So thank you for being with us tonight, and we'll see you again soon.